Hello everyone. Welcome back to this uh, episode from our brand new series that we have titled uh, The Qibla Controversy. This is Al Fadi and with me here in studio is Dr. Jay Smith as we continue to unpack the controversy that arose uh, between basically the findings of Dan Gibson and the attempt to refute that by Dr. David King. Jay, last time we began to at least explore uh, some of the uh, presuppositions and the arguments that were raised by Dr. King in regards to the findings by Dan Gibson. What is it that we are going to discuss today in that regard? Well, now we're going to go and we're going to look at what King is saying, and then we're going to look and see what Dan's response to it. The King was saying basically that these earlier barbaric people who were unknowledgeable, they were not clever, they didn't know mathematics, uh, they use stosis, uh, um, they use equinox, they use all these different other lines, they use uh, these the solstice lines, so, I didn't even know the word, solstitial lines, is that how you say it in English? I'm asking you in Arab how to say it in English. <laughs> and so these solstitial lines, now what are we talking about? Well, when the, uh, as we go through the year, because of the fact that uh, we're, on a, we're oblong, we're, we're, we're not perfectly spherical and we're not moving perfectly at one, uh, one angle towards the sun, we have a summer and it, it moves back right. and forth and right. so you have when the when the days are exactly equal i think it's march 20th or 22nd in september 2027 when they're not, when they you have the days exactly the same that's the equinox but when the days are furthest apart so for us in the northern hemisphere the shortest day would be june 20th or 21st and this long as it would be december 20th 21st that's the solstice you have a line that goes then along that day for its longest and, and who was using this and so these this is what king is saying they use they use this solstice lines and the equinox lines. Meaning the Muslims. The Muslims to make get their Qiblas. So they, they, were, were, they were intellectual enough to figure that out. Uh, yes, because they could see the sun. They could see where, okay. and they knew when the longest day was. And everybody, and this is known for centuries. They always and and I'm, by the way, I'm saying intellectual enough in a positive way. They were intellectual enough to notice that, yet I'm surprised that they couldn't tell the, dif the direction of Mecca without the use of this. So what they were interested in is they were not interested in Mecca per se, they were interested in just uh, taking that which had always been their history, the solstice lines and the equinox line, and then pattering their mosques again, uh, along those lines. Now, it, as we've read in chapter two, verse 149 to 150. In the Quran. It, yeah. In the Quran, it says, direct face, direct it. What's it? The uh, uh, Masjid al Khram. It's very clear. It's Whatever you are, face it. Yeah. Basically. Not, there's nothing about solstice here. There's nothing about yeah. equinox here. Yeah. There's nothing any, about any lines. There's nothing about any celestial gallery or the. The, this holy celestial gallery that that King talks about, nothing, none of this is any in any of the Quran or or in anything that comes from the seventh and eighth century. This is what the ninth intent, and in this case, Al Bazdawi. Al Bazdawi. It's not Al Badawi. We thought it was Al Badawi, but it's actually Al Bazdawi, who died um, ten thirty is when he was born. He died in eleven hundred, and he was the one that wrote this. And remember, King wrote a paper on him, so that's why King likes to quote him. And King likes. Uh, he's from Samarkand. Uh, this Al Bazdawi is. So he's from Samarkand, which means Central Asia. Yeah, Uzbekistan. Wh which basically indicates to me that uh, Islam actually didn't get there until almost around the same time. Right, so he's w f hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years later. He's now s suggesting that this is why these mosques are, have a, a confused Qibla. It's because they're following the solstice line and they're following the equinox line. Now, <laughs> what's What's most interesting is that King says, uh, quoting Bazdawi, that therefore the earliest these equinox these equinox solstitial lines and also the fact that they the sunrise of the winter sunrise which is the the, um, the solstice line they, because of the fact that they only had this to go on uh, they were completely inexact and that's why they were not towards Mecca. Though they still knew Mecca, and you're right, remember what you said in the last episode, they still went to Mecca, uh, because that's what the pilgrimage that's was. Right. And so they, certainly Muhammad was living in Mecca, so therefore, the seventh and eighth century, we're talking about people that were where the prophet lived, and they always went to the pilgrimage. And so they still knew how to get there, but they just didn't know how to direct their their mosque there, so they used these other solstice lines or equinox lines, and that explains those parallel lines that we saw right. in the, the last uh, episode. Now, what's fascinating, 
he make, he makes it, he quotes Buzz Dowie in saying that therefore the best finding when they use mathematics and they were able to come to a much more sophisticated method of finding their Qibla, they had by far more accurate Qiblas. So let's take that comment on board. Did they have the more accurate Qiblas? What do you think? The t at the time of Buzz Dowie? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, let's... let's 9th, 10th, 11th century. Let's hypothetically say they did have the most accurate Qiblas. You would think so, right? Right. Because better... Later, it gets better. It gets better as you learn more. Correct. Exactly. We, we now know exact distances. We know exact. And that's directions. what I was going with. That using his argument, like the later, they beca became more efficient. This is a 21st century thinking. This is a right. European and a Western way of thinking. We know better than they do because we have better material. Uh, we have mathematics, and this was Buzz Dowie's attitude. Uh, it looks like, and Dan Gibson read this, and he was scratching his head and saying, "Hey, there's a problem here." Because if they were better, they should really have had more accurate Qiblas, don't you think? That's right. So let's look and see. Look at the Petra Qiblas, the 20 Petra Qiblas that were discovered before, uh, within, uh, uh, certainly most of them by 706. Mm -hmm. They're 2.9 degrees of accuracy. From thousands of miles away, Canton, way over in China, thousands of miles away, Shedamon in Kerala, thousands of miles away. They're 2.9 degree of accuracy. If you take away the two worst, so 18 of the 20, it comes to, down to 1.9. That's pretty accurate. Wow. That's pretty accurate. Let's go put up that thing up again. Now let's take a look at that graph. What about the between ones? Remember the between ones that were created by Al Hajjaj? Al -Hajjaj yeah. That were in a place that made no sense, that were actually nowhere. There's nothing there, no structure, no building, not even a, not even a mountain, not even a, an oasis, nothing. Footprint, nothing's there. They're less than a degree of accuracy. Less than a degree, that's how accurate they were. Right. Now let's look at the parallel mosques. Parallel mosques are going straight south. They're within 3.5 degrees of accuracy. But uh, I mean, if you look at it, the further you, uh, you're away from there, you'll see that it's amazing parallelism that was taking place. Now it's let's go to the Meccan ones. Right. The bl purple ones, they're on the screen. 4.78 degrees of accuracy. Even if you want to take that argument, take a look. The Meccan Qiblas are the worst, the most inaccurate. They didn't get better, they got worse. That's right. That's and right. why did they get worse? Well, remember, there's a reason why they got worse, and Gibson explains it to us. And the reason is very simple. When you look at the, uh, what the, or who the Nabataeans are, because these are the Nabataeans, these are the precursors to the Arabs. And as you're, as you're gonna tell us, an awful lot of them, uh, we get an awful lot of what we know today about Islam comes from That's the right. Nabataeans, uh, the language as well. We're gonna be talking about that in another episode, in a whole other series, about just the influence of the Nabataeans on the Arabs. But what we do know is that the Nabataeans didn't have, the Romans hadn't built the roads yet. And remember the Nabataeans were the great traders. They were the ones that took goods from the Mediterranean and went all the way as far as China. They were well known as being in far as China. We even know of Chinese who were brought, who were brought back to the Nabataean courts uh, back in hundreds of years before the time of Muhammad. So the Nabataeans in China had an awful lot of, of trade already. And people say, how could they have a mosque built in the seventh century in Canton? Well, the reason why is because the Nabataeans were already there. That's right. And when the, That's right. Yeah. the Nabataeans were the only ones that ever were able to cross the deserts, that's why they were such good traders. And since they were the only ones that could go that route, you can't go north because you have the Hindu Kush and you have the Himalayas. They couldn't get over the mountains, so they had to go to India. And they went up that route over east, over into China, or they went to the eastern coast of India and took boats the rest of the way. And that's interesting because they went over there, they built obviously uh, some sort of a structure or a temple to face their own form of Qibla in Petra. So these are the temples, these are the Nabataean temples That's that right. became the mosques. That's right. And they were, this would also make sense because what's the word for the mosque again? Masjid, masjid. al-Haram? What does masjid mean? Masjid meaning just a place of prayer. A place of prayer. Where you bow, bow down, down, you know, basically. You bow down. Yeah. And that would be what the Nabataeans were doing. So masjid is actually a word that comes from Nabataean. It actually is derived. We're going to get into that later as the borrowed words that come from Nabataean. You're going to be excited when you see that, but that's not right for now. Nonetheless, what we are saying is these Nabataeans, they were all over the place. They were got as far away as Canton. And they had across the deserts. So they didn't have roads. By the time the 9th and 10th century came around, they did start putting in roads in there, and that's why... 
much, uh, many of the later ones did not know what the earlier ones did. But That's what did right. the early ones do? Let's take a look at that image. And this is what we know as the Kamal, K-A-M-A-L, best we can do, derive it from in English. The Kamal was what was used by the Nabataeans whenever they went across the desert. Now, they did have roads, and those, the sands kept on shifting. Right. So they didn't use anything that they could look at, they used the horizon. But they needed something to judge the horizon by. So they used the North Star. The North Star always is a constant. It's the brightest star in the heavens. And that's why they could always find it. And remember, back in those, I mean, even today, there are very few clouds then, and there's, uh, it's very arid, so therefore the North Star was always visible at nighttime. And you can see a, a picture there of what the North Star looked like. It's at the bottom part of the, the big, what we call the Big Dipper. But this North Star is how they would then image how they were to go north and south. And they would take either their fingers or they would take a block of wood that had strings with knots on it. Mm -hmm. And they would hold it up in front of them with a string in their mouth and they put their finger up, let's say two or three fingers, because they knew how many fingers would be a constant for them, for their fingers, and they put it above the horizon, and as they would bring it forward, as they pull the string forward till this North Star was touching at the top and the horizon was on the bottom, that knot then told them what their direction was and how, much, how far they had to go, how many knots they had to go in that direction. Now that, that works okay for North and South. What did they do for east and west east and west but wait, before we even get into that before we get into the north uh, south as they went through those knots how did they know how to how many marches or how long to go from north and south well they had a number of steps they had to take so if every knot this was so many thousands or tens of thousands of steps now if you start counting you start to lose track don't you that's right so what did the Nabataeans do what did these traders do they would recite poetry, hmm. famous pieces of drama. Imr al Kais, remember Imr al Kais, who right. was writing these great poetry? Why do you think he was writing this great poetry? And that's why the Arabs love poetry. They would recite this poetry and they would walk alongside the camels. The camels would carry the goods. They'd be walking alongside and they would just quote this poetry. And they knew that they had to go north or south this many times, this many sequences of this particular poem or this particular. Uh, uh, a, a particular uh, drama that they had memorized. That's why they were so good at poetry. That's why they're still doing it today. Look at camel herders today. Now today they ride on the camels, and, but they're still singing. They're still doing the poetry as an Arab. Remember, they still go and they have these beautiful uh, cadences as they're walking along. They're doing what their predecessors did 1,400 years ago. 1,400 years ago, this was quite normal. So you go this many cadences of this particular poem, but what about east and west? Yeah. Well, to go east and west, you need to look at the next slide, and I wanna put this next slide up. To go east and west, they had designated 32 stars in the heavens that were well designated by the Nabataeans. They knew that these 32, and they knew where all these 32 stars were. Now there were millions of stars, but these are the 32 that they did. And you can see the list of them all there in that circular, that circular dial. Now, let's just take, for instance, let's just say they came to the northern position. They needed to go east, right? So they went to, they put al Naka. I put al Naka up there. You can see it circled in green. And they knew that they were to go so many cadences of this poetry towards al Naka. Once they finished those cadences, then let's say they went up to this next star, which is Altir. They turned left to go to Altir. So many cadences or so many mm -hmm. pieces of poetry. And that's how they knew that they were to go. And they had it already in memorized how many cadences of this piece of poetry they were to go towards al Naka, how many cadences they needed to turn to the left to go towards al Naka. I'm sorry, Altir. And by the time they got there, that's where the oasis was. And that's where they got their water. If they got it just wrong by a few cadences, they would miss the oasis. They would die. Mm. Can you see how this was so important? Now, they were the only ones that could do this. And still today, that poetry has still been recited today. We think they're just doing it for entertainment. No, this was for survival. This was for, for survival. So basically, using these methods was extremely vital for them, for their survival. And it had to be exact. And you don't think in a religion of works like Islam, facing in a specific direction and earning credit or deeds for prayer, 
isn't that important also spiritually? I would suggest yes, and I would suggest this probably comes from these very same practices that they did in the case for their commerce, for survival, to get from one place to another across swaths of land, hundreds yeah. of miles, thousands of miles of just yeah. desert. They had to be able to know how to go, how to, to be able to find the water for themselves and the camel. Now, can you then understand why this... The, uh, the, these practices were no longer needed once roads were introduced and once shipping was introduced. And that's why they didn't use these in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, because now they had huge metropolises. They all had roads going from one place to another. Once you have roads, you don't need to worry about deserts. You don't need to worry about stars. And so that whole, that entire corpus of practice went out of style. That's why in the 9th, 10th, 11th century, they didn't know how to do this. And that's why they had no idea. But what's curious to me is why didn't anybody write it? Why didn't they go back to the seventh and eighth century? What happened to all that, that, uh, that learning? What happened to all those trades? What have happened to all this great knowledge that was used quite cohesively? That's not for me to say. All I want to say, and for this episode, and we is, isn't it great? Isn't it interesting that it's not the later ones that are the more clever? It's actually the earlier ones that are the more clever. Absolutely. The earlier ones using poetry and the stars. Astronomy. Not astrology. Astronomy. Now, this has been used for centuries on the seas. This is how they may were able to get ships across water, using the stars. Because they're, again, like on the sea, there's, not, there's nothing that you can look at. There's no outcropping here or a tree there or a piece of rock over here or a building in here. No, you have nothing but water that's always flowing, moving. And so you had to use the stars. Just like the seafarers on the seas, the, so far the sand dwellers on the sands use the exact same type of astro astronomy. But in this case, rather than being on boats, they were on camels or walking on foot. Ooh, that proved to me that these guys were astute. This is your ancestor we're talking about. You come from a great tradition, Al-Fadi. You come from a great tradition that has been lost. And unfortunately, because of the fact it was so exact, so precise, no wonder they knew their Qiblas so well. And that's why they could build a Qibla, a mosque with a Qibla thousands of miles away and know exactly where it was to be because they had the stars to guide them. And absolutely, I agree with you. I mean, if, if uh, again, I'm, I'm playing the devil's advocate. If I were to take Dr. King's argument about the later Muslims were able with accuracy to pinpoint Mecca, where Mecca is, and yet earlier Muslims were able to survive using methodologies that are so complex like this, but they failed to find the direction of Mecca, then one would say the later Muslims are more Muslims and more righteous than the earlier ones. <laughs> and that in and of itself should be problematic. Should be problematic. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's exciting now to... Uh, find out what else we are going to uncover. The next we episode, we're going to look at the seven criteria that good old Mr. King comes up with, Dr. King comes up with, and we're going to shoot down every one of them. And you heard it from the mouth of the lion. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video, and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.